Welcome to the podcast series Talking Success, connecting the global fintech community. I'm Stacey Jafter, and today I'll be chatting with Mike Scott, CEO and co founder of Nona. Nona helps funded businesses accelerate their software projects. They believe that all software should be built with a level of care, excellence, and experience. This is why they exist to reduce the risk for you and make sure that your software build is a success. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Good, Stacey. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. How's your day been? Yeah, it's been good. It's um, 7 p.m. now on a rainy, windy evening in Adelaide. Um, my, day's, my day's been pretty good. Um, I went to a spring festival at my five-year-old daughter's school, so that was, that was Cute. interesting. Yeah. So she's at the Waldorf School, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but it's a very alternative yes, schooling system, which um, for the kindergarten years is just amazing. And it's just the most incredible experience. They kind of welcome in the season with, you know, like 20 under five-year-old kids sitting for 45 minutes in complete silence, listening to stories and songs. It's just like, I don't know how these teachers get that right. A while back, we chatted about your parenting style and parenting is something you're really passionate about. Why the Waldorf School? (laughs) So this is a very loaded question, but I'll I'll go there. (laughs) So, um, so Look, I, I grew up in, in Cape Town in South Africa and um, mm-hmm. I was a very difficult child. So I'm... Um, How so? so? I, well, okay, so I'm six foot five and I'm 105 kilograms. And I was born, <laughs> I was born really big, right? And I'm the youngest of yeah. four boys. So I've got three older brothers. So I was much bigger than all the other kids. And I thought I was much mm-hmm. older than them too. But obviously mm-hmm. I wasn't, you know, because I had these older brothers and I was really big. Mm-hmm. And um, I was just a nightmare kid. I was just extremely disruptive, very loud. I got really mm-hmm. bored really easily. Uh, nothing's changed. And um, anyway, when I was about, <laughs> oh, what was it? I was probably about 11 years old. The school mm-hmm. I was at basically said to my parents, look, put this kid on Ritalin or we can expel him. One of the two. And um, my wow. dad, who's just the most amazing, ma- amazing human being, he was like, look, this kid's not hyperactive. We're definitely not putting him on Ritalin. So I guess we're going to take him out of the school. And they were just extremely patient and supportive and, and, you know, mm-hmm. my dad, especially. That's incredible. Just, it, it really was. He was, you know, he would just sit and talk to me for hours and hours and hours about, you know, self-observation and meditation mm-hmm. and these things, which at the time were just not, they were not mainstream. You know, this is, this is what, 30 years ago almost. Um, anyway, and, and pretty much at that stage, one of the only schools that, that would take a kid that was basically expelled was the Waldorf school. So, I went to the Waldorf school for four years when I was um, around 12 years old. And it was absolutely amazing for me um, for a short space of time. So Mm -hmm. I was there for four years. It it really helped. Um, I was still a nightmare. It didn't didn't change me being a little (laughs) kid. (laughs) But it it, it really did help. And I did four years there. And then I sort of went to my parents and said, hey, look, I'm this has been great, but I'm, I'm kind of bored. I'm kind of unstimulated. Mm-hmm. I want to go to, to a different school. And I went to, yeah. you couldn't have picked a more opposite school to Waldorf with the school that I finished at, which was Westerford, which was an absolutely awesome school. Um, yeah. So I was kind of exposed to Waldorf and there's parts of it that I love and parts of it that I don't. And the parts that I really, really love are, are the kindergarten parts, the very, very early, mm-hmm. early stages, because what they focus on more than anything is building resilience and independence. And for me, that's just like a critical life skill above almost anything Definitely. else. And, you know, our, our parenting style is, is certainly not mainstream, but like we don't, we don't give Layla any screen time at all, like none. Mm-hmm. And we just think that there's a lot more, you've got your whole life for that, right? And the exactly. Waldorf sort of schooling system at, at the young age is just all about resilience, being, being able to get back up, independence, forming your own identity and, um, yeah, so it's you know that's what led led me to it, and it, it's mm-hmm. been absolutely phenomenal for her. Whether we keep her there for the full schooling career, I, I don't know. Yeah, but the kindergarten uh, sort of experience is amazing. I love how creative the Waldorf schools are. They they encourage the students to explore and think outside the box. There's no one correct answer, which is really awesome, especially at a young age that when or if they enter a more traditional curriculum, they have the capability to think differently and form their own opinions. And that's what we want in the world. The last thing we want is for everyone to think the same way. Yeah, and it's not for everyone. You know, I'm, as I said, I'm mm-hmm. one, of four, one of four boys and, you know, two of us, well, I, I went to the Waldorf school for a while. The, the other three all went yeah. to the same school and 
I think one of them would have enjoyed the Waldorf school, the other two would have hated it. You know, it's not, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's not for everybody. Um, and it's also not necessarily for your whole school career either. Mike, I already know we both are going to go off on so many tangents because whenever we do talk, that happens. I think I'm just so excited about, one, your your thoughts, your processes, just the way you live. I'm excited to dive into it. I want to hear about your life journey and, and really what led you to Bold Nona. Yeah, sure. So as I said, grew up in, um, grew up, grew up in Cape Town in, in Half Bay, um, youngest of four boys. Um, parents laid an incredible foundation for us. We, we didn't grow up with a lot mm-hmm. of money. Um, we certainly weren't poor, but we, we, we definitely weren't wealthy at all. Uh, to give you context, there were, there were six of us in the family and I think our house was about a hundred square meters. And wow. so we certainly didn't grow up with opulence and wealth, but mm-hmm. we really had fantastic foundations set by our parents. Um, you know, my dad never missed a rugby game of any of ours. And just bear in mind, there's 10 years between me and my oldest brother. So yeah. you can do the maths. There's four of us. I mean, that's a lot of rugby games. And you know, Dedication, for sure. Complete dedication, complete stability, complete love, complete um, kind of attention. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't have fancy cars. We never went on holiday. Um, we, we never went overseas ever, literally. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it was kind of funny because growing up, I was kind of embarrassed. I never wanted friends at my house because, you know, all my friends were very wealthy and didn't want them to come to my house. Mm -hmm. And it's just been super interesting watching my own view of that change over the years. You know, now, now looking back that that I'm an adult and I have kids, I wouldn't trade that for the world. You know, the the foundations and the fundamentals that my brothers and I have got from my parents, just from having this this absolute kind of predictability and stability um, trumps any amount of money that we we might have had as kids, Mm -hmm. which we didn't have. And, um, you know, I, I guess at their core, my parents were entrepreneurs, um, you know, from a financial perspective, maybe not the most <laughs> successful ones, but, but they were entrepreneurs. Um, my dad had his own businesses. Mm-hmm. My mom also ended up starting her own business, which actually did quite well. Um, wow. And I think from an early age, it just, it, it just kind of bit me. I mean, I used to run around the neighborhood with a skateboard and, and wash cars, you know, with, like have washing liquids and things on cars yeah. and go wash cars for, for two rand a car, you know? And, <laughs> And then go and buy sweets and get sugar overloads and, and eat myself to, to sickness. But it, <laughs> it just kind of was always in me because I think we didn't have a lot of excess. So if I wanted any yeah. money, I, I kind of had to make it. Um, mm-hmm. Started my first business when I was in school. Um, I have a cousin who's now um, extremely successful in, in the US. Um, and he had started a little tech support business and and he was moving on to, to actually go live in Australia. And I, I basically bought for almost nothing this, this little business from him in 1999, mm-hmm. which was in my second last year of school and that business um went on to actually become a decent business and i ended up exiting that business about 15 years later um that business was kind of my my learning experience that's why you were in high school i was in high school but i but i kept the business for a long time and i I got a bit trapped by it to be honest and that that's kind of where where i learned how not to do everything and you know but at the same time learned how to run a business, how to build a culture, how to mm-hmm. do all those things. Mm-hmm. And mainly by failing, mainly by getting it wrong and then realizing, oh, wait, I should have done that. Now I get why this doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, somewhere along the line, we, I employed one of my, my best friends at the time. And we, he had sort of said, listen, there's this guy that you've got to meet who's um, super, super smart, studying at the University of Cape Town. You're doing actuarial science and, um, you know, you really should consider adding web development to your business Um, because my business was a tech support business and clients used to quite often ask us for websites. Mm -hmm. And this guy's name was Ed. And, you know, I went to Ed and I said, hey, do you you want a job? Do you want to come work for me? And he said, not a chance. I'm not going to come work for you, but but let's talk about (laughs) starting a business together. Um, So we started talking about that. And then he said, yeah, but listen, you know, you've got to take my friend Gordon, who's the designer as well. So I said, cool, let's, let's talk to Gordon. And then they said, hey, if you start a business with us, you, you really want to get Paul involved, who was a super smart developer and also a great designer. So mm-hmm. it was Paul. And then Andrew, who who put us all together, was, was also a co-founder. So before we knew it, we had five co-founders and we had started this business. And that business was sort of started to build, you know, 5,000 Rand WordPress microsites. And this was in mm-hmm. 2012. And I didn't really think it would become anything significant at the time. But 
very quickly, I realized that this business actually had much more potential than my current business. Mm -hmm. And that these guys that I co-founded this business with were actually really competent people that that would be great to work with. Um, God, this, this was a completely separate entity. Completely separate entity. Um, they operated out of my office. Um, basically, in the beginning, all I did was bring clients. And, um, and that was that. And within a few months, I think, it became pretty evident to me that actually this thing's got more potential than, than I realized and that this could become... Mm -hmm you know, a significant business. And sure, it's a long story, but, you know, cut a long story short, we fast forward from 2012 12 until until where we are now. And, and that business has grown to, you know, 30 people, clients around the world. Um, we work on very large, very complex software development projects. Um, we built a culture that is absolutely incredible that I'm very proud to be a part of. Um, and it's, it's actually amazing to consider where we've gotten to from where we started. Um, Definitely. And, and all the lessons along the way. So there were five co-founders of Nona and then a lot of different opinions, different ways of running a business. How was that experience? And would you do anything differently? <laughs> yeah, so look, it, it, it was <laughs> extremely difficult and, and is still extremely difficult. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll try and make it short, but just to illustrate how difficult it was, two of those co-founders are, are no longer shareholders and no longer directors. We, we bought them up. Mm -hmm. um, and... It, it's it's very difficult, you know, when you when you get people together that are highly opinionated, um, very driven. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really difficult, and we also chose to have a completely flat structure, so there was no leader, there was no CEO, yeah. there was no okay, but this guy gets to make the final decision, or let's go to her for to break the deadlock, or what have you. That that didn't exist. We were five equal, complete equals in the business. And that worked quite well for a while. It actually worked very well for a while. It worked very well until we were, oh, I don't know, probably 10 or 15 people in the business. Um, but then it became very difficult to kind of get through things because what would happen is we would just kind of go down these complete endless discussions where because mm -hmm. there was no one who could kind of break the deadlock, they would just go on forever. Yeah. And, um, you know, cut a long story short, um, one of the one of the shareholders was was kind of quite unhappy at one stage, and decided that this is not really what he wants to do. Um, so we said, well, look, you know, you you don't have to stay, and, and and we bought him out, and that was totally amicable and fine. And then mm -hmm. a few years went by, and then a similar thing happened with with the second shareholder. Um, what would I do differently again? Um, I think if I take it back a few steps, the first business I was a hundred percent shareholder, and at that stage I had said. I will never start a business with a business partner. I'll never do anything with a partner. Mm -hmm. I always want to do it on my own. Now that I've got business partners, if I fast forward to today, I've got exceptionally strong, competent, really mm -hmm. good human beings as business partners. And my, my statement has completely flipped. I will never, ever start a business again on my own. Never. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sure, you can make more money. Sure, you can have 100% and control and ownership. But that stuff just isn't, as important to me anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think the lesson in it is that it's very difficult. It's very painful. It's very frustrating. Um, and it's really a big journey of self-discovery and self-reflection because, you know, we've, we've built this culture and, and the culture starts at the leadership team. And that culture in the leadership team is extremely high performing, um, extremely, extremely open and honest, but it's not always pretty, right? Like we're a very high trust team. But that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we sit there high-fiving each other and agreeing with everything. In fact, <laughs> quite the contrary. Of there's, there's a lot yeah. of arguing. There's a lot of like, um, I don't want to say bickering because we don't really bicker, but, you know, particularly with Ed and myself. So Ed is, is my co-founder and he's the chief operating officer. Him mm -hmm. and I argue a hell of a lot. Um, but the way that I describe it to people is that we argue in the same direction. So it's not personal. It's not about pushing agenda. It's Definitely. almost always about arguing for what's best for the business, what's best for us. And while it can be very frustrating, I think Ed and I sort of recognized in each other very early on that although we drive each other nuts and although <laughs> we really irritate each other, we kind of recognized in each other that we were very good for the business and for each other in terms of challenging, yeah. in terms of that sort of stuff. So, you know, there were lots of times, I think, when we 
wanted to leave and wanted to exit and you know this this is terrible and I don't want to work with this guy and what have you but you know now if I take Ed for example I she's I I wouldn't want to start another business without him and I wouldn't want to start a business without my, my partners today and in fact we have actually started other businesses together yeah. and you know I, th- I think the lesson there is just what I said a little earlier is that high trust teams they don't look how a lot of people think they look you know, it's not this this sort of pleasant, um, <laughs> kind of easygoing, chilled, sitting around at <laughs> a table like a family. Yeah. It's not. It's actually very highly charged often. Um, but the trust is there in the way that you're comfortable and safe to say what you need to say without fear of judgment and without fear of being shut down. Um, so, you know, through all of this, it's it's really about just making sure that you pick your partners very, very well in, in your ventures. Um, and it's a difficult thing because you're kind of, it's kind of like getting married, right? You you don't know what you don't know getting into a venture. And yeah. you've really got to go through what the divorce will look like and what could possibly go wrong. And when it does go wrong. You don't get married to get divorced. Exactly. But but you've mm-hmm. got to look at like when, when and if this thing fails, like how would it fail? Yeah. Why would it fail? And, um, and then it's really just about being prepared to learn and grow you know oftentimes when i'm furious at one of my business partners when i really look at it like the majority of that is probably me it's probably something i've done or i've contributed or how am i reacting to this or how could i do it differently and what is my part in this and all of these sort of things and being willing to grow and adapt with each other um a lot of self-reflection a lot of self-reflection and i mean business is you know people say you know business is not personal business is extremely personal it's all Mm -hmm. people and it's all about relationships and um you know within my leadership style and the way that i I choose to kind of lead the team and the way that we choose to operate it's all about communication it's all about getting to trust it's all about building containers it's all about creating platforms for feedback and honesty and this stuff is difficult. It's difficult and it requires constant deliberate action. Yeah. Um, so what would I do differently again? I, I don't know if I would do anything differently again. You know, what, was it painful at times? Absolutely. Could we have gotten mm-hmm. to where we are faster? Yeah, completely. But I don't think I would have changed it because I've learned, I've learned such a massive amount about myself, um, about my partners, about the ones that, that are still together, about the ones that left. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, those lessons are, are really, really valuable. Um, so I don't think I would change anything other than it's just validated that moving forward, I'll, I'll never, ever start another business on my own again. Having partners is, is critical. It sounds like you and Ed are both just really passionate people and push each other to be better or think differently. <laughs> and I think that that's sometimes really important You'd, to have a partner that just thinks exactly like you. You, you need somebody who comes in with, with a different angle as well. You're a remote CEO how do you get that feedback? How do you also lead a business when, when no one is watching? How do you create a culture? Yeah, so look, I think I think creating a culture remotely with a distributed team must be very, very difficult. We mm-hmm. we were lucky in that we grew Nona around a beautiful physical space. You know, we had this beautiful office in the old castle brewery in, in Woodstock in Cape Town. And we would do cooked lunches every day and play hacky sack. Mm-hmm. And there was just this mm-hmm. amazing space that people would hang out in all the time. And there were beers after work and just the, the, the kind of almost the stereotype tech company, you know, and it really did become a huge part of our culture. And so we, we created this culture over, over however many years. And, and that culture has been, I think one of the reasons that we've actually gotten through these difficult times. Now, to create that in a distributed team, I, I got to be honest, I don't know if that's possible, like to create okay. that from scratch, but to nurture it and to keep it going, while it's very difficult, I think we've managed to do it. And, and I'll try and share some very practical things that we do. So first of all, our values are absolutely ingrained in everything that we do. And we speak about them every day. We speak about them with, with how we do everything. They, they really do guide what we do. So as much as it's kind of cliche and, and airy-fairy to a lot of people, I think your values have got to be extremely strong. They've got to be turned into actionable words that you can you can actually act on. So, for example, mm-hmm. we don't say um, improvement. For example, our value is continuous improvement as a way of life. We mm-hmm. don't say um, you know generosity. We say be generous with your knowledge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
And these values, awesome. are, I think, are just so critical to to how you show up in the world. So have your values there and, and repeat them a lot. From a practical perspective, it's all about communication. Um, you know, I, I often say to people when you're when you when you're remote, especially in a leadership role, when you think you're communicating enough, triple it, and that'll be enough. So I'll, I'll try and sort of sort of paint a picture for you. So this is what a typical week looks like in terms of communication, just just from mm-hmm. me. So every Monday, I will send a five minute selfie video to the whole team. That video awesome. will say, "Hey guys, these are my focuses for the week." These are the notable meetings I'm having this week. These are my observations and learning from the past seven days. This is the content that I'm consuming. And then anything else, there'll always be some other stuff, usually like celebrations or wins or what have you. So I do that in under five minutes every Monday so that everyone can kind of get a sense of what I'm seeing, who I'm meeting, what I'm learning, what I'm observing, because I'm making decisions, right? And people need Such to a know- idea where those decisions are coming from, what is influencing me, what is influencing the team, why am I bringing things to the leadership team for us to decide on, like where's that coming from, who have I met, what have I learned, what books have I read that week, what podcasts, etc. So that's mm-hmm. number one. Um, number two, we do a company-wide stand-up every week. So it's very quick. Um, I don't actually do that. My co-founder Ed does that. Um, and then I'll do it once a month from now on, actually. Um, and that's basically just financial snapshot of the business, um, interesting project news in the business, interesting people news in the business, any other announcements or just, you know, just information. And then we always do something fun at the end, which usually takes the form of a question that's usually quite awkward and embarrassing because we, we <laughs> like awkward and embarrassing at Donut. Um, Love it. I have a huddle every single day with my leadership team, which is uh, 15 minutes. And then we allow another 15 minutes for discussion. I do a two hour leadership meeting every week with my team. Um, I do something that I call 27 questions with every single person in the whole business once a quarter, where I schedule 45 minutes to an hour, just one-on-one. I try not to talk. I basically just ask them these 27 questions and I just listen. And it's really just, it's a time to to be heard for everyone. It's a time to get a sense of where everybody is at. Um, I also do something called um, AMAs, like Ask Me Anythings, um, which is basically... I'll throw out a couple of topics. Um, people vote on what they want to talk about or they can raise their own topics. And it's really just a nice it's a platform to just give anyone a, a, a sort of a voice or, or ask a question. It's not compulsory. You don't have to join. Usually about half the business joins. And we just discuss anything um, that's topical and nothing's out of bounds. Um, and so it goes and so it goes. And these things are all about culture. They're all about yeah. culture. It's about communication. It's about staying connected. So the remote leadership thing is, has been quite tricky. And I've actually re- I've written a couple of articles on, on this, on sort of our, our learnings and, you know, the questions that remain unanswered and the things that we have solved. Um, and and it's, a, it's a constant work in progress. Um, I feel like we were very far ahead of the curve when, when COVID hit. Um, but I also feel like the world is kind of all at the same place now. I don't think anyone is sort of has nailed this yet. I, I feel like we were very far ahead of the curve, but now I feel... Like we've got a lot of work to do to make the next step change in terms of yeah. really understanding how to keep humans connected when they can't meet in a physical space. It's it's very, very difficult. Yeah, keeping on evolving and, and working to, to how you can be better. Yeah, exactly. Something that, that you spoke about in, in the past with me is struggling with control and, and delegating. How did you eventually learn to let go of that control and then delegate? Yeah, so, you know, I, I get asked this a lot and I, I actually don't know what the answer to the question is, but but I'm going to okay. try and just share okay. some experience. So if I think of the single most difficult thing that I've ever let go of in terms of delegation, it's it's managing cash flow. So I remember when I was sort of quite young in my first business, I, I had effectively failed the business. It, it was effectively insolvent right it wasn't a lot of money so it wasn't like it felt like a huge deal at the time but thinking back i kind of wish that those were my problems today you know but um (laughs) but my dad i remember my dad taught me how to run a daily cash flow um which is which is a very rare thing i don't think many people run a cash flow on a daily basis and i was in my early 20s when i learned that tool and it's a very simple tool but that tool basically got me through running a business for the next i don't know 10 years and mm-hmm. it was kind of like 
everything else is details. But if you don't have cash, you cannot operate a business. So you can kind of, you can make as many excuses as you want. You can focus on this fad and that fad and this new mm -hmm. technique and that technique. But at the end of the day, if you don't have cash in your business, you don't have a business. And as my mentor used to say to me, um, turnover is vanity, profit is sanity, but cash is reality. And, mm. you know, the cash flow for me was the one thing that I just would not give up. And if I think about how I gave that up, it was because we hired someone into the business. His name's Jared, who is our financial director. And he's absolutely awesome. He, he is a, a big reason that Nona still exists. He's a big reason of the successes that we've had. Um, he treated the business as if it were his own from the first day he stepped in the door. Um, and he's mm. just been an incredible part of our leadership team. Um, wow. and, and we're very lucky to have him. And I guess the reason why I'm painting this picture is because, you know, unfortunately your listeners are probably not going to get much benefit from this, but the way that I learned to give up control is by getting the right people into the business that could do what I was mm -hmm. doing better than I could do it. Delegation will just become so easy because you've got the right people yeah. to do the right things. That's such a great point. Mike, I have one question left that I personally am really excited to hear the answer to because we've spoken about structure and routine that creates yeah. freedom and peace. I would love to hear what your daily routine looks like and, and how you keep yourself accountable and then how you've incorporated this into your lifestyle over, over the years and what's been game changing. Yeah, sure. So look, I, I, I'm absolutely sort of obsessed with, with habits, habit formation, habit optimization. Um, there's some amazing literature and books out there at the moment, which, which are very mainstream things like atomic habits. Um, and my habits are, are sort of mixed up and I guess my routines are, are mixed up throughout the day. So in my morning, um, and not every morning looks the same, but it, it does largely look the same. So my morning routine consists of usually waking up between 5 a.m. and 6.30 a.m. That's usually a function of mm -hmm. what time I go to sleep. Um, I try to prioritize eight hours of sleep over my waking up time. Um, I know okay. that that's not um, the same for everybody, but for me, sleep is, is just absolutely critical. So for me, my routine starts the night before. So what I mean by that is I try very, very hard, and I, I get this right almost every day, is I try not to have mm -hmm. any screen time for an hour before I go to sleep. So, um, game changing you know, when absolutely, um, and not just for your own mental health, but you know, if you live with other people, if you live with a husband or a wife or a partner, what have you, mm -hmm. you actually have to interact, right? If there's no screens on, <laughs> yeah. well, what do you do? You talk to each other, right? <laughs> exactly. And, and if you're married, you, that should be something you should do, right? Although so few of us yeah. do unless we forced to. So, so that's the first thing is like, when we finish this podcast in 20 minutes, it'll be eight o'clock. I'll turn everything off and I'll probably go to sleep at nine mm -hmm. or nine 30. Right. So that's the first thing. It actually starts the night before. Um, if I've had a very stressful day, I'll do a meditation the night before. Um, or mm -hmm. I, I love the Wim Hof breathing method, which I'll speak about later. Um, by the way, that's probably the biggest game changing thing that I do is the Wim Hof. Really? Okay. Yes, yeah, it's, it's absolutely life changing. And then I go to sleep, right? Um, I turn my phone on flight mode, as I said, about an hour before I go to sleep. Then I sleep for eight hours whenever I can. The first thing that I do in the morning is a thing actually that I don't do. It's not a doing, it's a non-doing. Mm -hmm. So the most important part of my day is whether or not I'm able to not turn my phone on in the morning. Mm. If I'm able to keep my phone on flight mode for the first two hours of being awake, my day is completely different. If I'm wow. not able to, and I roll over with my eyes half asleep and turn my phone on and start going through email and Slack and WhatsApp and who knows what else, yeah. adrenaline shot straight into my heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And away mm -hmm. I go, that's it. I'm just running on full tilt for the rest of the day. Now, that's not a good thing, right? So the first yeah. thing in my morning is actually a non-doing. It's my alarm goes off and I go, okay, do not turn the phone on. Then I get up and I make my bed. Now, this making your bed story is actually really interesting. I can't remember where I read this, but that first 60 seconds of when you wake up is critical to the rest of your day. So mm -hmm. if I'm able to wake up, stand up immediately, make my bed, and not turn my phone on, it's kind of like the rest of my day is set up for me. From that point on, yeah. everything becomes easier. So after that, I will go straight to the kitchen and drink a big glass of water. Um, I do intermittent fasting every day. So last, you know, I'll eat, I'll eat dinner every day at six o'clock. 
and then I'll usually snack until basically until I go to sleep. So I'll snack until mm-hmm. about nine o'clock. Um, I then don't eat again until 12 o'clock the next day. So I don't eat breakfast. Um, so I just try to give my, my gut and my body a break from food and digestion mm-hmm. for between like 12 and 16 hours, depending on the day. Um, so after my glass of water, I will do a short meditation. Um, I use the Calm app, but there's plenty of apps out there, Headspace. Yeah. Just, you don't even need an app. You can just do it yourself um, for 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, then I'll do some push-ups. So I do a lot of push-ups throughout the day. I'll do like anywhere between 50 and 500 push-ups throughout the day. And I just spread them What's up. your personal best, Mike? What's your personal best? They um, want to know. We had this challenge at, at, at work. I think I did. Yeah. I've actually got it written down. I, I think I did about 650 in one day. What? Um, but it's not, you know, it sounds like a lot, but that's like, it's sets of 10, right? So anyone yeah, who's yeah, yeah. fit could do that. It's just a, it's just a hassle. Um, but that's, it's actually not that good, to be honest, because there's no ways you're doing perfect form for 650 yeah, push-ups. Yeah. And it was just a bit of a joke. We were all doing it together. And, and um, I just did as many as I could. And someone else actually beat me, which I was obviously bleak about. But, but it's <laughs> not because it, <laughs> it, means, it means that they're into it too. Um, so, yeah, so I do lots of push-ups. So I'll do anywhere between, like, I don't know, 20 and 50 push-ups after I do some meditation. Um, and I'll just sort of stagger these throughout the day, right? Um, then I'll go for a walk. So I'll work, walk for at least 45 minutes. Um, and this is still quite early in the morning. It's often still dark at this stage. And I'll, my phone will still be off in flight mode, but I'll listen to an audiobook or a podcast. And I'll walk for 45 minutes, which is anywhere between like three and six kilometers, depending on where I'm walking. Mm-hmm. It'll always be in nature. So like under trees. It makes a massive wow. difference to me walking in like the city versus walking in nature. And Sounds like a dream. Yeah. And it's it's this is actually really, really important for me because – it changes my entire mood. It changes my entire mindset. Mm-hmm. And it also is like where I'm most creative. So I'll have my note app open, even though my phone's in flight mode. And this is where I get most of my ideas from most of my LinkedIn posts on thought leadership and mm-hmm. and that and that kind of thing. And also the articles that I write. So, you know, there's, a, there's something I really do believe very, very strongly. And that is that by default, as humans, we're, we're kind of wired to believe that our actions follow our mood or our actions follow our emotions. Mm. So like if we're in a good mood, we do these things. If we're in a bad mood, we do those things. Mm-hmm. And that is true. But what a lot of people don't realize is that you absolutely have the ability for your mood and your emotions to follow your actions. In other words, you can do things that make you feel better. You can do yeah. things that change your mood. You can do things that change your emotion. And if you want to be more dramatic about that, what I'm saying is like you can take action to decrease your depression, or you can take action mm-hmm. to decrease your anxiety. And for me, that's what routines and habits are all about, is I do those things because I know that I'm prone to falling into states of like worry and catastrophizing and these sort of things. Yeah. I know that about myself. So I also know now that if I go for a walk and I do this and I meditate and I do Wim Hof and I do cold immersions and all yeah. these things, I just know myself that I'm going to feel much better after that. And my entire outlook on life will change in a matter of minutes. Right. Yeah. So I do my 45 minute walk. Um, I get back and I'm feeling much better. I do some more push ups. I write for 20 minutes. So I have a separate laptop that I only write on. That's all I do on that laptop mm-hmm. um, because I want to get better at writing. And how do you get better at something? Well, you do it more. So Working on skills. Yeah. That's it. So I write for 20 minutes every day. Um, most of the time I'll delete what I've written because it's crap. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> And then it'll take the form of an article or, or something like that. Yeah. And I'll do some more push-ups. Then I'll journal. So journaling for me has always been difficult. I've never found it easy. Um, I've been doing it for years. Mm. I, I still don't find it easy. Journaling for me is just about getting things out of my head. Um, it's about expressing gratitude because that doesn't wow. come easily to me, but it's a very powerful thing to do. And, you know, I'm the kind of person, unfortunately, that if 27 things are going amazingly in my life, and one thing is going a little badly, all I will think about is the one thing. Yeah. So the process of journaling and gratitude is, is very powerful because you sit down and you go, huh, that, you know, things are actually pretty good. That's actually really good. I'm actually yeah. really lucky. That's really good. And sure, the one thing is still there, but it's just like it's 10% less intense, right? Um, and then the last thing I'll do in my morning routine is I'll sit down at my desk, I'll open my laptop, and I'll triage my tasks. So it's a long process that I've sort of developed over the years, but it's um, – I use the Eisenhower matrix and Trello to prioritize my tasks into categories. And the ones that make it to the top, 
I then put onto my calendar and I work off a calendar. So I don't work off a mm. to-do list, I work off a calendar. And that's really important because even if you're able to triage your to-do list well, you still work from your to-do list and it's very unlikely you're working in the confines of reality. When mm-hmm. you put things onto your calendar, you realize that you only have so much time and therefore you can't get everything done that you wanted to get done. So what are you going to cut? What are you going to, what are yeah. you going to prioritize? Um, and that's pretty much my morning routine most mornings. And I also believe that a lot of the value is actually just in the discipline itself, not even necessarily in the actual specific routine. I am excited to listen back to this episode because I've just learned so much from you and I was smiling through this whole thing. Um, I really appreciate you coming on to this episode. I've learned personally a lot and I know others out there have as well. Um, where can listeners find you and reach you? Where's the best place? Yeah, so I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn. Um, so mm-hmm. Mike Scott on, on LinkedIn. Um, and if you want to get all of us on, at, at a business level, you can email us at hello at donor.digital. Great. Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks for having me, Stace, and uh, go well. Of course. Talk soon. You too. Cheers. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Talking Success, Connecting the Global Fintech Community. Feel free to follow us on LinkedIn at Talent in the Cloud. And if you're interested in exec talent, expanding your team, or you yourself are looking for a new, exciting change in your career, check out our website, talentinthecloud.io.